Welcome to ClearSea's webinar on our Maritime Commercial Incidents and Accidents Dashboard. My name is Edward Downing, Communications Director at ClearSea's. Before we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, the Stolo, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam Nations. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Paul Blumeris, Executive Director at ClearSea's, and Tessa Colthard, uh, research associate. Next slide. Over the next 40 minutes or so, they'll provide a project context and overview, demonstrate navigating our new dashboard, offer insights in the project applications and analytical results, and there will be a Q&A at the end. So be sure to submit your questions throughout in the question field. Please don't use the online chat. And we will make every effort to answer every question and get back the post uh, all the questions uh, sometime after the seminar. And now, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Edward. Uh, hello, my name is Paul Blumeris. Uh, I'm the Executive Director here at Clear Seas. Uh, J'aimerais souhaiter la bienvenue à tous les francophones qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui. Uh, comme mentionné dans l'invitation, la présentation sera en anglais aujourd'hui. Uh, mais le tableau de bord et le rapport technique sont disponibles en français. Uh, si vous le souhaitez, vous pourrez nous poser vos questions en français uh, lors de la période uh, de questions. So, uh, before we get started, um, a few words uh, about Clear Seas. Um, as many of you hopefully know, we, we are an independent uh, nonprofit research and communication organization. Um, we're focused on the safety and sustainability of, of marine shipping. And our work really involves a lot of communicating uh, complex issues. Uh, and we do that through a number of uh, web-based and social media platforms uh, to reach now uh, actually over half a million users uh, in Canada uh, and around the world. Uh, and you can see on the page here a sample of some of our publications and, and research activities. So, so over, the, over the six years that we've been operating, uh, a great deal of our focus has been on this question of the risks uh, presented by and the safety of marine shipping. Uh, several of the reports and analyses you see along the bottom of the page have, have really contributed to that subject. Um, but as we worked on this topic, we, we realized that uh, access to an important data source on, on what was happening and what had happened historically in terms of um, shipping incidents and accidents was missing. So in order to close that gap, uh, we uh, commissioned a project to create um, an, an easily accessible web-based mapping tool to present that data, that data on historic marine shipping uh, incidents and accidents. Uh, and the result uh, is the dashboard that we're, we're launching here today. Um, the, the goal of this dashboard is to present the public source information from Canadian and US sources that we've been able to access and present it to you in a geospatial way, i.e. on a map that allows you to, to browse through that information in its important uh, geographical context. Um, and we believe this dashboard will be a very, very valuable tool in the toolbox of anyone that is trying to better uh, assess uh, and manage the risks uh, presented by shipping. Uh, but don't just take uh, my word for it. Um, here, in the words of two of ClearSea's board members, you can see some of the key contributions we believe this uh, project achieves. Uh, namely, firstly, uh, providing uh, capacity for, for First Nations uh, and for wider First uh, Indigenous and coastal communities to really meaningfully uh, participate in, in risk management. And secondly, uh, providing a much greater transparency so that uh, industry safety measures can, can be improved. So I am going to hand over now to Tessa to explain in a bit more detail about this dashboard that we've created. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Hello everyone, my name is Tessa. I'm a research associate at ClearSeas and I helped create the Marine Incidents and Accidents Dashboard. I'll give you a bit of an overview of the project um, methodology and then take you on a little tour of the dashboard next. So the study area for this project includes all waters in Canada's exclusive economic zones, as well as several other areas. 
We chose to include the coastal waters of adjacent states, such as Washington, Maine, and southeastern Alaska, to gather a more accurate picture of marine incidents and accidents that have occurred in transboundary regions. Some interior waterways that see commercial marine shipping traffic were also included, such as the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence River, the Mackenzie River, Baker Lake, and more. Data were gathered over a 10-year time period from January 2009 to December 2018. Because Clear Seas is focused on researching commercial marine shipping, only vessels like cargo ships, tankers, tugs, and barges were included. We did also include large ocean-going cruise ships and ferries to, pro to provide context and a reference point for users. All types of marine occurrences relating to the ships themselves were included in the study, so crew-related incidents and accidents on board vessels were filtered out. For this project, all of the data were gathered from publicly available government sources, where location information for each marine occurrence is available. We downloaded data extracts from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada's MARSIS database and the US Coast Guard's missile database. You can download data tables for free from their websites, um, and the data is usually quite up to date depending on which tables you download. So when we downloaded when we downloaded the data from each of the sources, we filtered the data to fit our time frame and then clipped the data set to our study area extent. We also filtered out vessel types that aren't included in the study, like fishing vessels, small passenger vessels, and others. I would say the most challenging part of this project was trying to align the data from the different sources to create one complete data set. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada and the US Coast Guard don't define or record marine occurrences in the same way. Different terminology is used and different types of information are gathered for each marine occurrence. So Clear Seas developed classification strategies for marine occurrence types and vessel types to help integrate the data together. So this table shows how we classify the different vessel types for this project. You can see in this middle column that there are several different ways to classify tankers in the TSBC dataset for the Transportation Safety Board of Canada's dataset, and one category of tank ship in the US Coast Guard dataset with all of these vessel types making up the Clear Seas cargo tanker category. Also, some manual cleaning of the data was one of, or was also done to improve the quality of the data set. So records lacking latitude, longitude, identification information, or any other key information were removed. Duplicate records were removed and any marine occurrences that were reported by both the Canadian and American agencies were reviewed and only one of those records was kept. We noticed some inaccuracies and inconsistencies in the data during this review process. Um, and where possible, we corrected the misclassified records or we noted the inconsistencies and plan to report them to the organization, organization responsible so that they can review the records and make updates if needed. So although one of our goals in this project was to create a comprehensive and clean data set of vessels involved in marine occurrences, there are still some limitations to the data that should be considered. The TSBC and the US Coast Guard databases are populated from public reports, and many of the reports are not verified, so the quality of the data cannot be guaranteed. And like many large geospatial data sets, location coordinates for some of the records are inaccurate, leading to the incorrect geographic placements of the data points. So you can see in this image here that there is a point for a ferry that is clearly located on land in Quebec, when in reality, this probably wasn't the case. Um, because it's hard for us to know exactly where this vessel was involved in an incident or accident, we haven't moved the location. Some other vessel or occurrence attributes seem to be conflicting or mislabeled, and if we did have enough information to correct them, then the incorrect, or if we didn't have enough information to correct them, then the incorrect records will still exist in the data set, and you'll be able to see them in the dashboard. Our methodology of cleaning and classifying the data may also have some limitations. So, the data that we have only includes specific commercial vessel types, so not all marine occurrences that have been reported appear in our data set. Also, the study area includes some interior waterways that support commercial mar maritime shipping, but not all interior waterways. So the exclusion of these regions was determined by clear seas on a case-by-case -case basis. New definitions of marine incidents and accidents and serious accidents were developed by clear seas and applied to the data. And this classification was developed specifically for this project, so it might not be applicable to other projects. It will also make it difficult to compare the records or statistics from our Clear Seas data set to the information found in the MARSIS or missile databases. So this project shows one way to work with marine incident and accident information, and there may be other ways to interpret the data. 
So now that you have a bit of a background on the project and how we created the spatial data set, I'll give you a tour of the Marine Incidents and Accidents dashboard that we've made. So the purpose of this dashboard is to display the new integrated data set of vessels involved in marine occurrences in an interactive geospatial environment. We host the dashboard on ArcGIS Online and we'll have two versions available, one in English and one in French. The, this dashboard has an interactive map as the focus with lots of different options for filtering and generating insights. So it works better on a larger screen, like a laptop or monitor, and not so much on a phone. So I'm going to switch to the dashboard. So this is the fun part. Awesome. Here we are. So if you were to access this tool on your laptop, you might notice that the screen is compressing the dashboard so that some of the labels are shortened or cut off. You can change the zoom level of your screen to help this, fix this issue. Um, and when you arrive here at the dashboard, you'll see this map of Canada with lots of different colored points in addition to charts, graphs, and some other features. So over here, this about panel will give you a summary of the project and some tips on how to use the dashboard. So this is a good place to head back to if you're confused on what to do or if you just want to get another overview of the project. So the points on this map represent a vessel that was involved in a marine occurrence in the study area between 2009 and 2018. The colors indicate the type of vessel involved, which you can see in this legend here. You can click on one of these points to bring up more information about the vessel and the incident or accident in which it was involved. So these graphs and charts show the data that you're working with in a non-spatial way, but they can also act as filters. You can click on any one of these bars to filter the data by year, and you can see this indicator box change to show how many points you're seeing on the map with this filter applied. Click on the white space outside of the charts around here or in here to clear the filter. To filter by vessel type, click on the pie chart slices. So here we can filter by tug and we can see only points in orange are now showing and those represent all of the tugs that were involved in marine incidents or accidents. Using these selectors at the top, we can filter by other data attributes. So we can filter by region. Here I'm filtering just by the Atlantic regions. So that's what we're only seeing um, vessels involved in marine incidents or accidents in the Atlantic region. And then I can clear the filter again. We can also filter by only serious accidents or only vessels that are involved in pollution related occurrences. Searching by a location or by the name of the vessel involved lets you quickly find a specific occurrence you're interested in knowing more about or that you remember. So if I wanted to see all of the incidents around Prince Rupert, I can search Prince Rupert in this box here, click on Prince Rupert, and then it takes me right into this area. So recently, Clear Seas was able to use this tool to support a blog that was written on anchorages. This dashboard was used to determine how many incidents of dragged anchors happened around the port of Prince Rupert over a certain time period. After clicking on the points in this region, you'll see that most of the incidents involving bulk carriers were reports of dragged anchors. So if I filter here by bulk carriers and I click around on some of these blue points, see that most of them are talking about dragging anchors. So if I zoom out again, we can also show you how you can search by a vessel name. So let's say I remember a tug by the name of Charlene something or other that got into some trouble off the coast of Newfoundland a while back, and I'd like to learn more about it. I can clear this filter, type in Charlene into this box, and if I click the top one, there are multiple listings of the same name. That means that the same vessel was involved in multiple incidents or accidents. So if I click on this first one here, and zoom in a little bit, you can see that this orange shot is highlighted in blue. And the specific incident where the Charlene Hunt lost the toe of a derelict vessel actually has an investigation report attached to it. So if I click this link, it will take me to the TSBC's investigation report in a separate window, which I hope you guys can all see. So you can learn more, more about what they found from the investigation here. We really hope you'll give this dashboard a try and we look forward to hearing about what you're going to use it for. So I'm gonna head back to the, the PowerPoint slide and then pass back over to, to Paul. Thanks, Tessa, for that uh, 
great tour of the dashboard. Um, and thank you, by the way, also for all the hard work you put in uh, putting that together. Um, so hopefully you can see, and you've seen enough details to start getting an idea, uh, as Tessa said, about what you might be able to use the dashboard for. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So if you're watching this as, uh, as a live webinar, um, feel free to put some of your comments uh, into the Q&A section. And, and you know, if there's a particular region that you're hoping to study or a type of event occurrence that you're looking to, to research, we'd love to hear it from you. Um, and if you're watching this as a recording, um, uh, get in touch with us via, via our, uh, our email. So um, in this section of the, of the webinar, we wanted to kind of take you behind the scenes a little bit and show you some of the analysis that we've been doing in the background um, to both double check the data that we're getting and also gain some additional insights um, so we can share those with, uh, with you today. Um, so the first question we wanted to answer was, well, well, just how important is it to include the data from the US sources in the analysis of Canadian waters? We put a lot of effort into that um, and, you, and you heard from Tessa's description uh, what was involved in, in, in bringing in and harmonizing those databases. So um, Tessa, why don't you uh, maybe illustrate that for the audience in, in perhaps a, a very well-known piece of shared water that you hopefully recognize here with some major trans, uh, transboundary importance. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. So in this first image here, we have the Great Lakes region with just marine occurrence information from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada showing. If I flick to this image, uh, we've added marine casualty records from the United States Coast Guard database, which you can see at the points that are highlighted in yellow. So if I go back and forth, you can see that this is important to highlight because there are many incidents and accidents that have occurred close to the border. Um, and this expanded data coverage shown in these, this second map demonstrates you know, the benefit of assessing transboundary regions using multiple data sources for marine occurrences if it is possible. So incorporating this U.S. marine casualty data not only provided better data coverage in transboundary areas like the Great Lakes and you saw that you saw in the last slide, um, but also highlighted some gaps in the Canadian data. So here we again are just showing marine occurrence information from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada database. And then this map shows the west coast of Canada and all of the yellow highlighted points are records from the United States Coast Guard that are in Canadian waters or in the in the EEZ of Canada, but were not found in the TSBC Marine Occurrence Database. So some of these points are really close to the border, like you can see down here in the Salish Sea, um, but others are clearly in Canadian waters or in the EEZ, such as around here off of Haida Gwaii or along the Inside Passage. Fortunately, the majority of these highlighted records um, are marine incidents, so not accidents, so specifically incidents related to the total failure of any system on vessel. Also, most of these records in, actually involved U.S. flagged vessels, so they are mandated to report any marine casualties to the United States Coast Guard, even if they are in foreign waters. It should also be noted that while we try to remove any duplicate records between the U.S. and Canadian data sets, our method of identifying and removing duplicates is not 100% effective, so these records could also appear in the TSBC data set or database extract that we have but they might be under a different spelling of the vessel name or a different date, which makes it hard for us to match and then remove the, the duplicate records. Great. So uh, yeah, I guess you can you can see that there's, there's clearly still some more work to do to make the data set more complete, but certainly the, the investment in, in bringing in those US Coast Guard records is certainly um, paid off in terms of providing additional information um, you know, so if you if you are a researcher looking to try to understand historic incidents and accidents uh, and their their contribution to the risk uh, posed to Canadian coastlines, I think you'd agree that it's 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 quite an important data source. So, for instance, as Tessa mentioned, uh, off the coast of uh, Vancouver Island there, or off the coast of uh, part of Hawaii or other coastlines, um, this additional data provides really important information about um, incidents that have that have happened. So. Uh, Another topic we, we want to address is one that we often get asked, which is around concerns about oil spills. Um, and so for this reason, uh, we, we created the filter that uh, Tessa demonstrated earlier that allows you to, to see the um, incidents uh, or accidents in the dashboard that were involved uh, with the pollution event. 
So you can see on the screen a, a shot of the dashboard showing the 144 occurrences out of the 5,220 in the database uh, that resulted in pollution in the 10-year period of the study. Now I hasten to add it's, it's pollution both of oil of all kinds and not only oil spills, um, but it is an important ability to to filter. Um, and that uh, that was created using the uh, Transportation Safety Board of Canada uh, marine occurrence data. It actually has a field in it to indicate whether pollution occurred. And then we added to that um, the U.S. Coast Guard database has a different way of classifying pollution, um, but nevertheless we were able to to add uh, add records that are tagged uh, due to a, a discharge or a release of pollution uh, into the data set. So that's what's shown when you click on yes, uh, show only pollution occurrences. Um, and the first thing you notice is it's a relatively small number, 144 uh, events where some pollution occurred. Um, and considering the amount of the volume of shipping that's taking place over the 10-year period that we're studying. Um, but we really wanted to do a little bit more to dig into that and, and ensure that we're accurately portraying the, the history of pollution over the study period. Um, so one of the things we did was to, to compare the data from the records that we've got here with an extract from the, the Ship Source Oil Pollution Fund database of reports and claims uh, related to pollution. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the Ship Source Oil Pollution Fund, uh, there's more information about them on, on our website or indeed on, on their website. Um, but, but this database of, of reports and claims is a great uh, cross-check that we were able to do. Um, so the first thing we, we noted that there were a number of records, about 137 of them, that uh, of the 144 pollution events in the dashboard database that didn't actually match with a ship source oil pollution fund claim or report. So um, this clearly needs a bit more investigation. It's implying that there were, there were potentially uh, spills that didn't uh, end up as a claim or a report in the ship source oil pollution fund database. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, there were also 23 records where we did find a match between the ship source oil pollution fund database and our dashboard. Um, and not all of them were flagged as, as pollution events. Um, so I'll hand it back to Tessa to take you through some of the details of what we found. Awesome, thanks Paul. So there are many reasons why the Clear Seas Pollution Records and the SOPF records maybe aren't completely aligned. For example, we have U.S. Marine Casualty Records in our data set, and the SOPF data includes more than just vessels related to commercial marine shipping. Also, the pollution records we've identified include more than just oil spill-related pollution events, like Paul mentioned. Um, but we did find some interest, interesting overlap between the two data sets. So seven of the 23 matched records between the Clear Seas Marine Incidents and Accidents data set and the SOPF data extract of reports and claims also matched our pollution indicator field. So those are um, these records that are highlighted in yellow here. The other 16 were recorded as incidents and accidents, but were not identified as pollution-related occurrences. When we manually reviewed these 16 incidents, we found that most of them, or some of them, uh, most likely did result in pollution, but were just mislabeled when they were reported to the TSBC. But several others were claims against the SOPF for expenses incurred as part of the response effort, even when pollution did not occur. It should also be noted that our process of matching the data in our marine incidents and accidents data set and the pollution events found in the SOPF data extract, um, it's not 100% accurate either. So there could be additional matches that were not identified through this process. But this analysis highlights the need for more accurate reporting and identification of pollution-related occurrences, especially for people who are using marine occurrence data for decision-making or marine spatial planning for their coastal community. Thanks, Tessa. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I, would, uh, I would also emphasize that this, this shows you the work that we're doing in the background to help to improve uh, the fidelity of the data that, that, we're, that we're presenting to you through this, through this dashboard. Um, so the final piece of analysis that we want to show you uh, was an attempt to answer the question that we often get asked, which is, can this data tell me uh, how risky is shipping or how risky is a particular type of, of ship? Um, and so to, to try to answer that question, we did uh, some analysis for an area that we know very well from a previous Clear Seas report uh, on vessel traffic analysis, namely the, Sa the Salish Sea that you see represented here. Uh, in a map on the right hand side and you'll see why we needed to do it for this region in a minute. Um, 
So on the map here, you can see the dots representing uh, incidents or accidents that occurred in a fixed period between 24, in 20, 2014 and, and 2018. Um, you can see the port of Vancouver at the top. Uh, the dotted line is the is a border between uh, British Columbia and, and Washington State, and then the ports of Seattle and Tacoma down uh, in the south. Um, so the first thing we did was to calculate the average number of incidents and accidents per year of each vessel type that we had uh, in the database. Um, I, 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 how often does a, does a ship of each type report an incident or an accident to the relevant authorities, i.e. producing a dot on the map in an average year? And you can see that uh, graph that that's produced uh, on the left-hand side. But you can immediately see a problem here in that this isn't quite fair to different ship types because some ships clearly visit the region more frequently than others. So this is where the vessel traffic data comes in. So we know from our previous uh, vessel traffic analysis, um, the number of uh, vis uh, visits that each uh, ship type routinely make on, on the region in an average year. So you can see that plotted here. So now, now you can see that bulk carriers are clearly the most uh, common uh, ships in the region followed by container ships and you can see on down the list over there. So we can now divide one by the other. So if we take the annual average number of incidents from the first graph and divide it by the number of ships from the second graph, we can create an incident or an accident rate. So that's what you see here represented on this, on this chart. And it's quite interesting. Uh, the first thing is notice that with that normalization, you note that uh, the the rates are actually quite similar for for all the different ship types that we considered as part of this um, this analysis. So the way to read this is that uh, when a ship uh, of a particular type enters the region bound for either say uh, Seattle or, or Vancouver or, 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 or perhaps both ports, um, there's approximately a 1.5 percent likelihood that it will need to make an, an incident report to the relevant authorities. Uh, so that incident report might be a dragged anchor, it might be a failure of a system that could potentially have, have resulted in a risk to the vessel. And that's what represents the, the uh, incident rate. Um, and then the, the accident rate, uh, which is much lower, that's about 0.25% uh, on average. Um, and, and there, those kinds of accidents would it include, the most common type is an elision. So that's uh, striking a, a, an immovable object. It's quite often uh, the dock during uh, during docking, uh, or potentially a collision, uh, and that's actually com uh, quite commonly happens with uh, minor collisions with with, for instance, harbor tugs that are assisting in, in the docking process. So you can see that that already gives you some really interesting insights, and we're quite uh, fascinated by this topic. We we are intending to carry on this work, and we're looking at ways that we can gather data. Um, to expand this kind of analysis to, to other regions across Canada um, and to really help to con contextualize, contextualize the, uh, the marine occurrence uh, data found uh, during this project. So uh, that concludes our uh, analysis and insights uh, section. I think what we're going to do next is, is uh, hand it over to, uh, to some Q&A. Um, so I'm going to bring uh, Edward back in again, and uh, Edward can perhaps uh, begin processing through the, the questions. If you you can, uh, as we mentioned, there's a, there's the uh, the question and answer or the questions section of the of the go to meeting control um, panel should give you an opportunity to answer. And I see that that's quite a few coming in already. Yes, thank you very much, Paul and Tessa. That's a wonderful overview and a great. Uh, amount of work that you've put into this. Very impressive. So we've had quite a few questions come in and I'll kick off. We'll have time for, for a few of them. And as I say, uh, for those that we don't get to, we will uh, post responses on, on Clear Seas' website. So first comment was, great work. How often will this be updated? That's from Hassan Halabib. So Paul, perhaps you'd like to answer that? Yeah. Oh, I, I think uh, it really, Anything is possible. It really depends on how popular and this uh, this project is, and how much use we see getting made of this tool. Um, so I think uh, Tessa explained the data is updated periodically by by the different sources. So we, we can do we could re we can uh, rerun this data extract, um, and it really depends on on popularity. Uh, 
uh, as to whether uh, we continue to update it. Yes, so at the time of this project, data was not available after August 31st, 2019 for some of the MARSIS database outputs, for, so the database um, of the Transportation Safety Board of Canada, which is why we chose December 2018 as the end of the study's time frame, so we could uh, provide the most recent year with full year of data. Maybe future versions of this dashboard and the data set could be updated. Uh, with that additional information when that becomes available through the Transportation Safety Board of Canada's um, extract published online. Um, but it, it'll depend on data availability there too. Okay, thank you very much, Tessa. Uh, another question. In the case of a collision between two vessels, does the system show as a single incident with two ships recorded or as two incidents with one ship each, as each ship might have reported the incidents separately? Awesome, that's a great question. So yeah, yes, <laughs> this, uh, this dashboard actually shows vessels involved in marine occurrences. So if there were two vessels that collided, there would be two data points um, on the map that you could switch through. So that's a, a good point. Um, if you do click on one of the, the data points and you notice that there is a little one out of two or one out of more uh, section on the uh, info box that pops up, that might mean that you can flick in between the different information boxes to see if there are any points that are in the exact same area. Thanks for that question, that's great. Great, thank you very much Tessa. Another question, uh, I'd be interested to learn the rationale for excluding fishing vessels. They can hold a non-trivial amount of fuel up to 10,000 liters, which isn't abnormal. I'll have a, I'll have a go at that. I, I think we um... Uh, we've heard this response from a number of, of sources, and I think we it's you know, our initial focus was Bersi's mandate is focused around uh, commercial marine shipping, so shipping that transports goods um, uh, and commodities. But as we've worked through you know some of our more recent uh, research projects on on addressing concerns related to coastal um, coastal traffic safety uh, and the concerns voiced by by Indigenous and coastal communities. Um, I think we're hearing more often um, both both fishing vessels and um, uh, and pleasure vessels are actually of concern to those communities and their interaction with the marine environment. So we're certainly considering that as an opportunity uh, for us to update um, and and perhaps as a as a future version of this uh, dashboard uh, could include those categories of vessels. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Thanks, Tessa and Paul. Great presentation and an impressive tool. Now, you gave an example of looking at vessels dragging anchor. Is there a way to select the accident type in order to create this type of report? Yeah, thanks so much. That is a great question. So I'm just going to switch. Hopefully you can see this. We're back on the, the dashboard here. We do have a filter by occurrence type, and these are clear seas occurrence type categories. So if you go into the report, you'll see how we classify the different types of marine occurrence, marine occurrences um, between the Transportation Safety Board of Canada and the US Coast Guard staves, data sets. So if we go here, we can filter by some different types of occurrences. For the specific um, example you brought up with the, the dragging anchor incidents, those are not um, specific marine occurrence types in either data bases, so either the TSBC or the US Coast Guards. So we found that information just from the summary or the description fields of in, in those marine occurrence records. So unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to filter by, um, you know, a dragged anchor, but you could filter by a risk of an incident, which might uh, pull up some of those records because they wouldn't be classified as a dragged anchor because that's not what they, the agency classified them as, but you would be able to find that information in the info boxes that are popped up. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Tessa. Now, another question, does the dashboard provide root cause info, for example, groundings or fire or some other occurrence? So no, this, there isn't root cause information unless it's found in the information pop-up windows. So if I click here for this marine occurrence, any type of cause information would be found in this section. If it does have an investigation report, 
then you would find even more um, information about why this might have happened. Um, but because investigations don't happen very frequently from the TSPC, um, then I would say that this is probably uh, the extent of root cause information that you would find from, from the data in this dashboard. And I think that's that's a great comment there, Tessa, and that, that the investigation report should be the source for that uh, mm -hmm. root cause, because as, as you point out, um, you know, the, the, the safety system is designed to encourage the reporting of an event before the root cause may well be understood so that we can have the data about what actually happened and where it happened and what um, and then only after the investigation will that information about the root cause potentially be revealed and then that's that's updated in the uh, in the incident report. Exactly. Great. Uh, another question. Can the data underlying the dashboard be downloaded and is that data updated and if so how often? So I think we, we touched on the updating. So we don't have a, a specific schedule for updating yet, but we do, the, the attention is there to update when additional data becomes available. Um, we encourage people to access the data through this dashboard. And, and if you have problems uh, working with it, or you would like to work with it in a different way, and a, downloading the data is the way that you, you think you can solve that, we would love if you came to talk to us about it because that will help us um, update the, the dashboard with more functionality to serve what you, what you want to use it for. Great, thanks very much again. Um, here's another question. You have categories on serious accidents and other specifications. How do you define a serious accident? Yeah, that's a great question. So as we mentioned before, we created our own definitions of marine incidents, accidents, and serious accidents. So in this context, the term serious marine accident refers to a marine occurrence with serious impacts, particularly in terms of damage to the ship, damage to the environment, or other types of damage. Uh, the following criteria I, I'm going to explain were used to define the serious marine accident uh, filter, and you can find this information in our report as well. So serious marine accidents include a marine occurrence, so an incident or accident that resulted in a TSBC or NTSB, uh, which is the National Transportation Safety Board, kind of the equivalent in the states, um, investigation. So all of those investigation reports would be serious marine accidents. Secondly, a marine casualty, so that comes from the US Coast Guard data set, identified as a serious marine accident in their database. So they have their own field in their database that says whether or not it was a serious marine accident. And uh, here in Canada, the Transportation Safety Board of Canada doesn't have that type of field. And then thirdly, a uh, marine occurrence with an IMO classification of serious incident or a very serious incident, according to the US Coast Guard reports, or an IMO class level of very serious marine casualty, according to the MARSIS database. Those inf or that type of information is also included in the database extract. So that would help, uh, that helped us classify serious marine accidents there. Great. Another question. I believe the uh, Canadian Coast Guard receives around 3,000 marine oil spill incident reports per annum. Were you able to access their database? We did not access that database for this. Uh, project. Oh, and I think that's a great, it's a good suggestion. I mean, what we, we did try to confine ourselves to publicly available data sets for the first mm -hmm. uh, iteration of this, of the dashboard. We gave you a little bit of a taste of what we've tried to do to cross check some of the data. The work we're doing now, I mentioned the, the, the risk analysis using traffic data that we'll probably have to, to use proprietary data sources looking at uh, AIS data. Um, and I think the same thing, so we're, we're open to opportunities to, to use um, other data sets to help improve the, improve the data. And, and this is a great suggestion of, of, of cross-checking against the, the Coast, Coast Guard um, data set. So thank you for the suggestion uh, from the questioner. Great. Uh, another question. Um, how does one get access to the dashboard? You can find the link on ClearSea's website. So you can go to our research page for maritime commercial incidents and accidents. And there you can download or read the report, which is a great thing to do before you start working with the data in the I'm dashboard. And then the page, actually. You've got the uh, tab open. Oh, yeah. I can search over here. Here we go. So this, this is is the research page for this project and here you can download the report and then you can explore the dashboard with this link here so head to the clearsees website 
that's how you'll find access to this. Good. Uh, a couple more questions is coming up. Um, hello, great presentation. Uh, some more a comment. I'm wondering if you plan on working with indigenous and coastal communities, specifically in the north, to add incidents and accidents that have not been documented in the government database. Perhaps this is not a data gap considering the types of vessels included in this analysis. This is out of scope, but I would think there are many unreported incidences, incidents sorry, and accidents with recreational vessels if you choose to expand this project, which would be interesting to see in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and, and we, we couldn't agree more. In fact, we, we do have, um, I don't know if some of you are subscribed to our newsletter, you'll note we've, we've launched an uh, Indigenous internship uh, program with a number of uh, Indigenous communities across Canada, where we've got interns working on on topics of interest to the communities where they're based on uh, and and this topic has exact topic has come up so um, both both recreation vessels but but we're also interested in in um, tapping into some uh, you know local knowledge about historic uh, incidents and accidents and cross-checking uh, of, of major vessels in, in, in maritime shipping to understand and cross-check against the data that we have um, so uh, we agree, and I think we, we'd love to hear from you as well if there are uh, you know ways that this, uh, this the scope could be improved and incorporated, or perhaps even uh, you know considering a mechanism to to um, to report and supplement the data based on based on the experience of of uh, local communities. I see a couple more questions coming through. Um, TSB's classifications of incidents and accidents cover a wide range of occurrences with related consequences. Your normalizing of the data to visit frequency as a start in determining risk rates, but it would be helpful to categorize the occurrences by consequence to get a proper assessment of risk. Uh, are you considering extension of your assessment in this direction? Thanks, Nigel, for the question. I, 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 that's a great point. I think we we this is uh we intended to do that just to give people a feeling for um as you say a first level cut on on normalization uh, obviously risk analysis is a is a is a uh, an important topic um and you know and there are lots of techniques that you can use as you point out um you know having if you have access to good information on the consequence of each accident type or incident type then as, as you point out you can create a much a better a, a richer risk assessment um, but what, what, one thing that we are help, hopeful that this this uh, dashboard will allow is for people to to process. You know, historic incidents and accidents are a critical part of of um, of risk analysis, and uh, this should give people uh, the ability to to discover those incidents in a particular geographic um, region without requiring you know their own complicated GIS uh, software. So um, you know, uh, we hope that risk users like yourself will be able to to use this kind of database to to um, extract and, and discover um, particular incident types in a geographic region, and then go on to use that in in whatever risk analysis um, uh, that you so desire. Uh, we are continuing with the risk assessment um, and, and kind of normalization uh, techniques uh, once as, as we get more data on on the vessel traffic volumes. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we'd love to be in touch with you about uh, diff different strategies for to, to create a better um, a record of, of different uh, of, of the risk um, presented by different occurrences. So, great suggestion. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Paul. Now, there's another question from Nigel, too. How, can, how far can you go back in the occurrence report record to get a long-term rate of occurrences? Yeah, so, do you want to take that one? So the the time frame. Yeah, I mean, what 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 we ch we chose to cut it off for a ten year mm -hmm. period, but there is data out there going further back. Um, mm -hmm. Want to talk about that? Yeah, so the, the MARSIS database has data going back quite far, um, but the quality changes over the years and the number of reports would change as well. So we stuck to the most recent complete years of data from the last ten years. Um, for this specific extract that we use as our framework from the tra from Transport Canada was, uh, I think the the extent goes back to 2004, and then that's it cuts off around August 2019, which is why we 
we made our end December 2018. So I would say if we were to use the exact same type of data and update the dashboard with um, data from farther back, we could go back to 2004. And then the US Coast Guard data would also go back quite far, probably farther than 2004. Yeah. I mean, I would highlight, I mean, Tessa mentioned it there, but we're, we're super cognizant of make of not jumping to conclusions about increases or decreases in incident or accident rate through time, because as anybody who's worked in this field knows, you know, more often than not, changes in reporting methods or changes in reporting styles, or um, you know, are uh, play havoc with any long-term trend analysis. So you know, that's why we haven't. You know, you can see the graph along the bottom produces you know attractive-looking uh, bar graphs, but I would. I would caution against drawing um, conclusions uh, too quickly by by just you know dropping a few uh, filters into the into the into the um, into the tool and, and and producing a bar chart. Um, so that's why you know certainly there's valuable historic data there, and as we know from, uh, for instance, uh, you know tracing you know where where there are incidents in the past. I think there's there's valuable data to be had, but it's a concern about the the completeness of the data set as you, as you go further back. Thank you, Paul. Uh, okay, a couple more questions now, but they still keep coming. So uh, <laughs> we'll, um, you, you showed an example of accident rates in the Salish Sea. Where do you find the rates for the different areas? Um, I can try and answer that. I think, so I think the, the what we showed you there was the calculations that we made for the Salish Sea. So we took data from the dashboard to give us the, the number of incidents and accidents uh, that happened in the Salish Sea. And then we, uh, then we divided by the, the number of ships that visited the same uh, region. So that the rates that you see calculated here, I think, thanks Tessa for flipping back there, are the, are the rates that we calculated for this region. So we were able to do that accident rate calculation because we had the vessel traffic data from our previous study on this region. Um, it is our intention to to continue with that analysis for other regions in Canada. Uh, so perhaps the answer to where where do you find the rates for different areas is by subscribing to our mailing list and uh, and then you'll get notified when we publish the findings of our uh, next what part part of our analysis. Great. Um, let's make this pretty much the final question. Uh, yeah, this is a longish one. So I would recommend that the dashboard explicitly explain its limitations, data sources, updates, and definition for each of the categories you are using. The dashboard is a good way to share data with the public, but since you're mixing data with multiple sources that you use your own categories and definition of those categories, there will be gaps with government data, and this will initiate a data war between government stakeholders, associations, and other interest groups. A very complex question. Yeah, that's a great point. There are definitely limitations to the way that we've displayed the data and our, our methodology in combining the data sets from the different agencies. I think the best way to, to answer that is that we've tried to make the report, which is our complete project methodology, quite accessible from the dashboard. So you can see in this about panel, the first link is read the report. We have another link to reading the report. And then down here, you can see the full report as well. So I would definitely like to push um, that everybody read the report and get a sense of how uh, our data set, our Clear Seas Marine Occurrence data set was created um, and why we, we made the decisions that we made to, to combine the different data sources. Yeah, I, I, that's a great explanation, Tessa. And I think that the, the questioner raises an excellent point. Um, you know, it's something that we were cognizant of you know that's always a trade-off right this com combining uh, as they point out combining d uh, different data sets um, you know requires you to make uh, compromises um, we think that the trade-offs are worthwhile based uh, I hope you agree if you look at what what's what you're now able to do in terms of accessing in one place uh, data sets that would be complicated to do otherwise absolutely the, the, the trade-off is the traceability and the transparency with the original data set uh, and the report is our attempt to remedy that. So we're trying to be as transparent as we can be about how, what we, how we manipulated the original government data sets to create this uh, more easily accessible and digestible uh, data set. Um, it's an attempt. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's our best, uh, best effort. And, uh, and uh, we hope we don't ca cause uh, 
a war of any kind, even a data war, <laughs> by publishing this uh, uh, this dashboard. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much to all our participants and our registrants today. Thank you for taking time out of your day and uh, uh, be sure to uh, uh, explore the dashboard and our supporting technical support. Uh, it's all on our website. There's news releases out. You may read about it in some of the in the maritime media too. Um, as you know, this this webinar is recorded. Uh, you will be getting an email link to it later, and all the questions will be answered and uh, we'll be posting the responses on our website uh, in the next few days or so. Uh, we love feedback, so make sure you fill out our survey. We're always looking to improve. Uh, share your feedback to also at info at uh, clearseas.org. Also keep an eye out for our upcoming research and resources. Uh, we've got something coming out on maritime governance shortly and decarbonization of marine shipping. And we're also working on a new microsite or ship source uh, waste key issues webpage. Uh, we hope to see that out in the next month or so. And of course, you can always stay in touch with us by signing up to our uh, quarterly newsletter. We promise we only send it uh, four times a year with the occasional email announcement. Uh, we don't like to overload with too much information. So again, thank you so much for your attention and time. And thank you to Paul and Tessa and the whole RKM team for a wonderful project and presentation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.